Hello explorers and welcome to another video. And today we are going to talk about a prototype that I made for work but during my free time. So, uh, usually I do not prepare anything in my spare time. I usually do everything at work and I love creating prototypes. But in this case, there were some thing that we needed at work and I had a little bit of spare time and I felt like creating something and as a creative person uh, you usually create even uh, independent on what time it is if you feel like uh, the that you're really inspired to create something you just do it and yeah, then you can take some off time during your work day, if that is allowed. Uh, so this is a prototype that I created and I haven't presented it at work yet. So I don't know if it's a good idea. I don't think that this is what we will use, but it will showcase a thing that we could use. And that's the important part of a prototype. So let's switch over to my screen here. First off, I'm going to talk a little bit about RabbitMQ. And RabbitMQ is a little bit weird to install. So this is some of all the different commands I ran in order to install it. First, you have the key management because it's not available in the standard repo of uh, Debian. So you need to add some uh, Launchpad and some uh, CloudNet IO here. Those are either required or they are some of the dependencies that they uh, would like you to use in order to get Erlang for RabbitMQ and the RabbitMQ server. And then we have these key servers. So I have one, two, and then I have these three here that takes down the RabbitMQ signing key, the public one, from both the uh, uh, GitHub page and the uh, rabbitmq.com page and uh, I'm not really sure if I did this because I didn't get the uh, latest one so I had to get it from the github page then we have this uh, Ubuntu keys key here which start with f660 which was required to get some of the packages in the U Ubuntu uh, repo as well that were dependencies that were required to be installed so there is a lot of keys and they talk about these keys on their website but they are i actually had to look into some stack overflow and find some more keys because the documentation on their web page described some of the keys but i thought that there were some that was missing and then i did an apt update i installed a lot of erlang tools and erlang is a very interesting language which has a running, um, like the JVM, it's something that runs, but in this case, an, an Erlang server starts a lot of processes. And the main thing about Erlang is that one of these processes should or could die, and that's no problem, you just start a new one. And it has a failover that uses this mechanic of killing things off if they aren't working and just starting new processes uh, and this is a very robust uh, language that were used in telecom uh, telecom uh, things in sweden in order to route calls back and forth so it's a very robust language for making these kind of message handling and RabbitMQ is using Erlang, which is a very good choice for a messaging queue application. And after we installed all this Erlang, we installed the RabbitMQ server. And then I wanted to have the management tooling so I could actually get a web GUI that I could work with. So I just enabled this. And the first time I did that, it crashed, didn't work. And that was because some of the keys were missing, so I had to hunt them down, install the keys, do an update, and then also upgrade the system. So I got the new Erlang server, and then I could enable this RabbitMQ management without it actually crashing. 
because I saw that the Erlang process was started, crashing, started, crashing, so it tried to get started but never ended up in a good state. So that's a way you can see that an Erlang process has some problem. Uh, and then uh, I used this Rabbit MQ uh, controller, added the new user with the password, and this is the password I'm using, but it's just a local password, and I will re remove this uh, later on, so it's not that important. I use n different passwords for everything. But the thing to notice here is that I only use characters and numbers. If you add anything else in this, you can have some problems with creating the user because some of these could be characters that are misinterpreted by the tooling. So that's why I changed from what I usually use, a longer password with some special characters, but in this case I couldn't do that. And then um, I did the sudo control set user tags admin administrator. And if you log in with the admin account before you do this, you will just get a prompt that says that you don't have access to anything. You don't have the right to see any virtual host or any messages or anything like that. By adding this user tag, you will become the administrator for the whole system and you can do whatever you like. So the first user should have this admin privilege. Uh, privileges and then you can create more users inside of the system afterwards. So let's switch over to the RabbitMQ console here and here I have my admin uh, place here and you see that you have a guest user and this has the name and password of guest that you can use because it's set up that way um, and it's only available on localhost and because this is a server that I run in my cluster I can't use that guest account because I don't have any localhost. And then uh, we have this uh, worker and that's one uh, that I will use in my uh, work here and it doesn't have any tags so it only has the availability to send and uh, do things with the queues that is on this virtual host of slash. So now I can send messages with this worker and it has the password worker as well. And then I need exchanges. So I created an exchange that I called workload. You can call it whatever you like, but it's a direct um, exchange. And I also created some queues here, one workload where I get all the messages that I send in and then I have a result queue that gets all the results back. And these are classical types and durable, so they will be there, they will not be removed. You can have different types and dif different arguments, but in this case, as a prototype, I just want the queues. And the thing I want to build is actually an application that can take a message, run a command locally on the worker, and then return back the result, the full log of what it actually did on that machine. Uh, so that's the main goal of this. And I thought a lot back and forth, and finally I figured out that defining what actual commands and parameters that were available, I should do that on the server end or the worker end and then I should just send simple messages to it in order to do that kind of work. So let's jump over to the RabbitMQ here and look at the prototype in action. So first off we need to go to the queues and the workload here. And I will send three different messages. First off, this will use JSON as the message body. So let's put in an empty JSON object here and send that. Then I also know that I could send in a command that I want to run. And let's just send in a command and call it echo because I know that that command is available. And lastly, I know that echo could require a message and we can say hello explorers. Put an exclamation mark there as well and run that. 
So now I've published three different messages. All of them have been sent and handled by my worker. And let's go over here to result. We see that we have three different results available. So let's go into that queue and look here. And we say that we want the last three. Get those messages. So first command that I sent was this empty message. And you see here that I get a lot of information here. It's running on the local worker at the moment. It wasn't able to run it because there is no command available. And it also tells me that available commands are echo. The next message I actually sent in the echo command, but then it tells me that the argument message is missing. And it also tells me what the message actually means. And here we have the last where you have an exit code of zero and it actually has run this message. So that was what I wanted to accomplish with this command or this tooling. So I want to put something into RabbitQ, run that and get the full log back. So I want everything that is sent to the console to be sent back to me in a message. So I know what's going on on the server when I run a command. So let's go over to the code here. So first off, I have this echo CMD file, which I have in the in project in commands directory. So in the same directory that the command or the tooling runs, I have the uh, command directory with all the commands. And now I only uh, put echo as an available command. And here we have the actual command that will be run on the console with a parameter or an argument. And then we have a short description and that's something that I will show if you have not put in a correct command. So you need more information about what's available to you. And then lastly, I have this description which prints out what to do with echo if you don't uh, supply or if you have the wrong arguments for the echo command. And if we go into this file here, so this is how to read the file. I just have a couple of string builders, a couple of different um, modes I can be in. And when, when I see the different headers, I go to the different modes and add things to the lines uh, using a buffered reader. So that's pretty simple way to get that command file. And uh, then I have a command line builder. Uh, let's see here if we can jump over a command line builder that will build this command. So it will go through and see if the command is actually available. Otherwise it will uh, populate something that I call an error message, which says that this command is missing and then give you the available commands. Otherwise I have the command file here and have an argument matcher. And if I find the argument in the string, but I can't find it in the message, I will tell you that the message is missing this specific argument and give that error message. Otherwise, I will uh, construct a result command and return that. And here we see this argument matcher, which takes everything with underscore or lowercase characters and brackets around it, fetch the, those different arguments, and gives you back something that you could uh, replace in your string and add the different things that you want to run on your console. So that's the command line builder. If we look at the app deployer, and this is just something that will be running. So here we have some setup for this logger up here. So I get something out on the console. And then I have a little thing here that takes the configuration file for this and types that out so I can actually input the correct information to run this command. And if we look at this configuration file, it just contains the host and port and worker name and so on for this uh, command. If we look at the actual file I'm running here, you see that I have the local worker. So that's what I see which worker I'm running at the moment and which queues I'm using and so on. So no, not much uh, into that. I will read that config file. I will set up the RabbitMQ uh, connection and create a consumer. 
and put that on the current uh, request queue. And then I have some work here to actually keep it alive. So that's a little bit of extra code for that. And in this uh, app consumer, I will uh, get the message. I will create a work directory I can work in. I will get the message and then I will acknowledge that I have gotten the message. I will get the specific job that I want to run and then handle that message. And if anything goes wrong, I want to send the full stack trace back uh, to the response. Uh, other, and also if there is a good response, I will send that message back and delete the uh, directory. So that's pretty much what I want to do with the queue and handle message. Doesn't do that much either. It will take everything that goes on on the uh, standard out and standard error. I will get that and send that back to the user. I use my command line builder here and the message in order to build the specific command uh, that I want to run. And if I can't build it, so in those cases where the command was missing or an argument was missing, I will return that error message to the user so they could actually supply the correct information. And else I want to run it, then I need to know if this is a Windows machine. And if so, I want to run it in a command um, and command ha handler. Otherwise in Unix systems, you can just run the command as is. And then I have this uh, runtime that I run it in, and then I will fetch both the error stream and the input stream. So I will get everything that is printed to the display and also the exit value. And then I have some information here that will display that in the correct manner. So I will get an header with what, uh, where it was done, what was sent in and the exit code before I actually get the full log. And that's pretty much it. Uh, so this was the full little prototype that I implemented here. And when you're running and creating a prototype, I, I can see it like you do the work and get three different results. One of the results could be, this is not correct. We, you did not go in the correct direction. And it's good to actually know that early. So if you put two hours into this, that I pretty much did for this project, and somebody says that this is not the way to go, then you have only thrown away two hours. If you put a week into this and then figure out that this was not the way to go, that would be bad. So prototype, do something quick and easy. Don't put too much effort into it. And if it's bad, just throw it away. And a second option I see is that you think it's good, but you don't think that this is exactly how to do it. And then just throw it away and implement the more correct solution. Or perhaps you can end up in a situation when you feel that it's really good, but you still need to throw it away and create the correct solution uh, because yeah, you need to actually think it over and implement it in a way that it actually suits your environment. And if you are throwing it away and it's not the correct solution, you can always create another prototype. And in some projects I've created up to 10 different prototypes and we figured out that one of them was the correct way to go. And sometimes I have tweaked and worked with the prototype and that that's usually when you do something visual you can create a prototype to show a visual flow and i think it should work like this it's a very simple javascript and html page that does something before you actually implement the real solution this is the way i do prototyping if you're doing it a different way or have any comments or suggestions leave them down in the comment section down below if you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.